everybody, welcome back to the channel. I'm Phil Weinberger and we're going to do something a little different in this video. This is actually going to be the first video, the, uh, the inaugural video, if you will, of a series of videos. They're going to be a little bit more like uh, interviews and clinical case presentations from different doctors um, and specialists. And we're going to go through um, different aspects of implant planning or endodontics or diagnosis in general using the CareStream software. I hope you guys like it and get a lot of education from it. Uh, the first video that we're going to do is with Dr. Leah Almatney. She is an oral maxillofacial radiologist. You might already have seen some of her webinars, uh, but she's also uh, CareStream Dental's clinical education specialist. She has her own private practice called See Through Reports. I'll put a link to her website in the description. You can also see it above my head. And uh, there is a lot to cover in these types of videos. We're gonna cover lots of stuff over the course of the series of these videos. Um, we'll try to keep it in smaller chunks. In this particular video, we're gonna focus um, more like on implant planning. Um, we'll probably narrow it down even further as we get into it. Uh, so let's get into it. Leia, thank you for doing this. Welcome, I appreciate it. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it'll be good for sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's so much to talk about with with uh, with implant planning. I really thought maybe we just kind of narrow it down a little bit. Um, I mean, there's a ton that we could actually cover, but mm -hmm. in a short video, maybe we just kind of focus on planning the maxilla today. I mean, what are your thoughts on what you want to do here? Yeah, like we can talk about like bone density, even like post implant placement. But if we start with anatomical landmarks and first focus on the maxilla, then in another session doing the mandible, that would be mm -hmm. great. This way we go step by step. Okay, that, that's perfect. So let's let's focus on that for sure. So I guess then the first question would be, I mean, what uh, what are the most common anatomical structures to consider when planning in the maxilla? So two of the most common structures um, that come to my mind, one is the anterior, one is in the anterior maxilla, that's the incisive of canal. And the second one is, are, are the maxillary sinuses. Mm -hmm. So especially if we're thinking of implant planning, these structures would come in contact um, with where you might be placing an implant. Um, so it's important to not just realize where the actual location is, but to see if there's something normal, if there's something abnormal, and if there's something we should do prior to implant placement. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay, do you want to, let's focus in first on, on uh, incisive uh, canal and then kind of kind of understand a little bit better about what to look for what's important, things like that. So maybe we can kind of go through a couple of cases together in the actual software and see exactly what we're talking about. Sure, let me share okay. my screen. Okay, so um, let's go to cases. The first one is, um, let's look at what a normal incisive of canal looks like, okay. and then we'll see what an abnormal incisive of canal can look like. So, on this one, let's first start with axial view. So I just went to oblique slicing, maximized my axial view, and I can use my sagittal and coronal slices on the side to try to locate where I'm at. So as I'm slicing through my scan and I'm scrolling superiorly, I can locate that incise of canal in the midline of the anterior maxilla. So as we're scrolling, you can tell that we have two foramina. We have one that communicates with the oral cavity. So now we're at the occlusal, um, we're, we're towards the occlusal plane. And we have a second foramen, or there are actually like multiple uh, foramina mm -hmm. that are the foramina of scarpa. So let's look at how the incisive of canal looks like on different views. I'm just gonna click with the wheel of my mouse on axial view to see what this looks like on sagittal and coronal. 
Okay, I'm zooming in. Okay. So I just rotated my slice. And you can see that that's what usually um, an, a normal incise of canal um, looks like. So really? it will be like a cylindrical shape canal and a typical diameter of an incisive canal. That's a two millimeter um, diameter. Um, sometimes it will range from less than one to two to three. Some are wider and you'll see like a four millimeter. Uh, but um, our range of normal will usually be less than six millimeters. Are there different shapes besides that normal like cylindrical shape that that uh, would help kind of deduce if it's abnormal or normal? Yes. OK, so. Um, this just happens to be like a, um, a, a cylinder shape, but there are other shapes like a, a funnel shape. Um, I think I actually have. Let me show you a slide. To show the different shapes. So these are the four shapes of the nasopalatine canal or incisive canal. Um, you'll see this is the shape that we were looking at. That's the most common shape that you'll see. Whereas other shapes include um, spindle shape, hourglass shape, funnel shape, and it's common to see them on different patients. It doesn't mean that there's an abnormality. It's just a variation of normal. Okay, so there's lots of variations of normal. So then really, how would one figure out exactly what's abnormal if there's so many variations of normal? Yeah, so radiographically, um, aside from the patient's clinical symptoms because well like if we talk about the patient's symptoms if there's if they are symptomatic they are feeling pain um, or maybe like a, a discomfort burning sensation and you can't figure out where it's coming from um, think of the think of an, an incise of canal cyst um, but radiographically we we have two um, two factors we look at. We look at the shape of an incisive of canal cyst, but we also look at the dimensions. And with these two combined, we can come up with a differential diagnosis. So when it comes to the shape, um, an incisive of canal cyst will usually, um, like you'll recognize like a, there's a mass inside it. So you'll see not just like a, a spindle shape, but you'll see that the cortices are are expanded, they are thinned and maybe even interrupted. And when it comes to the to the dimensions, um, it we usually consider an incise of canal cyst if it's larger or wider than six millimeters. Um, okay, let me so that's that's the, the threshold right around six millimeters. OK, yes. Um, let's look at an example of an incisive of canal cyst. This way we can um, compare normal with abnormal. Okay. While we're on this, while you're kind of showing this, are, are there are there the best views in the in the the software to see uh, incisive canal cyst, or is it pretty much all three views you really want to evaluate? Well. I think it's pretty much all three views. Okay. Um, the easiest one to detect an incisive of canal cyst would be an axial view. Um, as you're scrolling through the scan, uh, you can see that mass growing around on sagittal view. So let's first look at it to see what it looks like. And then I think it's also subjective, like whichever view somebody is comfortable with, then that's the view they would use. Okay. So um, as we're scrolling on axial view, you will see that that incisive canal at that point has a diameter that's 
large. We still don't know how wide um, this diameter is. So I'm just going to take my ruler measure and we see that it is larger than six millimeters. I'm going to hide my measurement so I can continue looking at what that incisive of canal looks like. So as we get to the nasal floor, it tapers down. So the widening is localized. That's usually a sign that there is a cyst. So it's not um, uniformly widened. There's a location where that cyst is growing. So I'm going to click with the wheel of my mouse and rotate my movement handles. And we can see that ballooned effect even on sagittal view. And let's see what that looks like on coronal view. Let me scroll back and forth. Now, this is probably uh, a mature, but not much, they don't mature, but um, it's probably been there for a while. Right. Um, it's it's a large incisive of canal cyst. Sometimes mm -hmm. like you'll be able to detect them at an early stage when they haven't grown that much. And patients can be asymptomatic. So regardless which view you decide that that's the view I'm most comfortable with deciding this looks like an incisive of canal cyst right. um, or measure. Um, you can see that it is widened on each one of them. Got it. Got it. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the sinus. All right. So maxillary sinus. Um, also, you know, I'm sure there's lots of things to cover regarding the maxillary sinus, but what are the most important things that you can look for uh, prior to or during the planning of an implant? Okay. So uh, for the maxillary sinuses, um, Let's also go through some scans instead of just having me talk. And um, let's look at what the sinus can look like normally. And then I'll show you a few examples of what abnormal can look like. Okay, so this is the large field of view. Um, we can see we have the like multiple anatomical structures, the paranasal sinuses, the ethmoid sinuses. But if we just focus in on the maxillary sinuses, right. um, the first thing we can notice is that this, the maxillary sinuses are symmetrical to each other in size. Um, they both have low in density. Um, well, they're both low in density. So it's normal and healthy patients, healthy sinuses, should have um, a dark density, a radiolucent area. We shouldn't have a soft tissue density like the ones we see um, in the orbits. So I'm just going to scroll from front to back so we can see both maxillary sinuses and the nasal cavity. Now, while we're, while we're on the subject real quick, is the coronal view really the, the, the best view to, to visualize the, the maxillary sinuses? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's the easiest view to visualize the maxillary sinuses. Okay. Um, we can see the same thing on axial, and as I'm scrolling, um, you can see the nasal septum that turbinates the sinuses, but, but truly, um, corona is the easiest and also um, easiest to relate to because patients, um, it's as if like you're looking with the patient facing you. Right. So as we're scrolling from front to back, we can see we have the nasal cavity. That's the nasal septum. So it's made up of bone and cartilage. Um, we have the turbinates. So that's the inferior middle turbinate. We also have a superior turbinate. Just let me find it. And um, the maxillary sinuses drain through the osteomyital complex. So that's the functional unit, the one we see right here. Mm -hmm. So that's where the sinuses drain into the nasal cavity and ethmoid sinuses. So that's what a healthy sinus um, usually looks like. Perfect. Now, now, there's a lot of 
mucosal thickening, um, types of mucosal thickening when it comes to looking at abnormality in the sinus, but specifically related to implant planning, one of the most common questions or um, or thoughts we usually have is related to a mucus retention pseudocyst or cyst, mucus retention cyst. So if a mucus retention cyst is actually a cyst or whether it's a mucus heal. So um, let me show you an example of um, one of these two because um, recognizing the difference between them prior to implant planning um, is important because one of them requires surgical intervention, whereas the other does not. Okay, so these are um, typical radiographic findings, um, characteristics of what a mucus retention pseudocyst or a mucus retention cyst looks like. You can see it has a dome shape, lobulated, it's homogeneous and it sits on the floor of the sinus or lateral wall of the sinus. Um, it's usually very self-limiting. It's benign. Um, it doesn't grow and cover the whole maxillary sinus. And you can see I have like a, a, a sun, a rising sun uh, picture just because uh, like a typical um, example of what we describe it like similar as is like how the sun rises. Right. So um, it has I a see. rising sun appearance. Okay. I, I see these, I mean, all the time when, when helping doctors in their software and training and things like that. And if you're new to CBCT, they get a lot of questions about, is this a important? Do I need to send this out? And things like that. And really the answer is it's no, we don't really have to be concerned about it, right? Yes. Okay. Well, no, yes, I agree with you. So, okay. uh, <laughs> right. yeah, so, um, so like the uh, studies have shown and like I use the numbers I'm going to share are from one. I think I can give it to you. You can put it in the description okay. is that these mucus retention pseudocysts, um, like throughout time, like the longest period that that this study, they have um, observed them, 60% of them, they really didn't change in size. They're, they're self-limiting. Um, so they either didn't change in size, 60%, 30% um, became um, smaller in size or they disappeared, and 10% increased in size. So um, as long as patients are asymptomatic, and the majority of these cases are, we shouldn't really do anything about them. Um, and they are as common as 13 to 14% in patients. If we like look back at studies, maybe in reality they are more common, but if they disappear, um, then we might not see them in follow-up uh, scans. Gotcha. So, did, I, did I hear it correctly that they could actually resolve with a good sneeze? Did I hear that? Am I hearing or, or, or no? Am, well, I making, um, am I making that up? <laughs> no, yes. Um, so, um, so how these mucus retention cysts happen is when we have a blockage of um, the steromucus uh, gland. And um, of the of the maxillary sinus. So if that if that gland is obstructed, we have an accumulation of fluid. So sometimes um, when patients, there was a study on that when patients sneeze, mm. um, that collection of fluid will pop right. Right. Um, due to pressure. So okay. so yes. This is correct. Okay, I thought I was making that up, but I did hear that somewhere. Okay, good. Probably from you. Yes. <laughs> no, okay. that is true. All right. But so usually if we just think of mucus retention cyst or pseudocyst and the term cyst and pseudocyst like 
I'm using them interchangeably just because radiographically we cannot tell the difference. Um, the only difference is the presence of an epithelial lining. And I think historically, like we've always historically, we've always we've always used the term pseudocyst just to differentiate it from a mucosil. OK. And uh, to like to. To really show that this is benign and this is not something we should act upon, whereas um, a cyst would be like an actual cyst and something we should treat. So a mucosil, an early stage, um, like an early mucosil, would can have the same shape of a mucus retention pseudo pseudocyst. Um, but the difference is it has a different origin. So we would see an obstruction of that osteomatal complex, the one we just saw on that healthy patient with healthy sinuses. Whereas the mucus retention cyst starts from um, the floor or like from the walls of the sinus. So that's one. And you can see like also the effect of um the cortices of the sinus right. because because a cyst is limiting is just an accumulation of fluid it's just sitting there it doesn't cause expansion doesn't cause thinning um whereas a mucosil can cause displacement of bone it can expand the bone um, it will obstruct the sinus and patients will be symptomatic Whereas in a mucus retention cyst, patients are asymptomatic. And they probably don't even recognize something's there. Uh, but because the shape is very similar or can be similar, um, we have to recognize the difference or form that differential diagnosis prior to implant planning. I'm assuming if they see a mucosil, the next step is to send to an ENT. Yes. OK. Yes. Yeah, because like this one requires surgical intervention, whereas this one does not. Okay. Uh, even if you cannot tell the difference between them, um, refer to an ENT or refer the scan for a consult just to make sure that you're ruling out this is not a mucus yet. Right. OK. OK, no, this this is perfect. That was amazing. So thank you so much. There's obviously a ton more we can cover when planning implants in the maxilla and even more specifically to uh, the maxillary sinus, but I think that's good for now and be nice and concise. And then other topics we can actually cover in future videos. So honestly, this was really perfect. So again, Leia, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, it was fun for sure. Um, I'm going to put links to your website for see-through reports in the description. I'm gonna put a couple links to your webinars also that you have with Cares from Dental in the description. Um, anything else that you want to comment on and say or, or, or promote? Um, no, that's it. Thank you for, for having me. And um, if anybody else has an idea on like what to discuss in a future video, that'll be good too. But yeah, put it, put it in the comments. Put it in the comments if you're interested in different topics. We'd love to hear what you guys think. And we'll definitely work on some future videos that uh, hopefully will be helpful. So awesome. Thank we'll you. We'll see you. Thank you.